and welcome to Lily High on Life with a really special, interesting, fascinating guest today, Philip Archer. Thank you so much for being a guest on Lily High on Life. Lily, I've been looking forward to this. Uh, high on Life must be an amazing experience for you. Um, so congratulations and thanks for having me. My pleasure. And the, the aim is really to get as many people high on life as we possibly can. So before we get into the essence of who and what you are and where you came from, you actually hold quite a senior position in the Rotary Club of Australia, I have had a couple of senior positions. And tell us a bit about what you're doing with Rotary right now and just a short synopsis of what Rotary is. So it's not quite true that I hold positions in Australia because no one does. Um, you, to give you a clear picture, I'll just explain to you, when you become a Rotarian, you get lent a badge during your membership, the badge of Rotary, and that's an, really an international passport for you to go anywhere in the world and make friends and get things done. So when you belong to Rotary, you belong to a club. And most people are happy just being a member of a club and doing their bit for their local community. You can also do some work at a district level. And a district's normally anywhere between 30 and 120 clubs. Mm -hmm. And I've had the opportunity to be a leader on the district stage as well as a district governor last year. Then, if you are lucky enough and you want to, you can actually be a member of the zone, not a member of the zone, but work on zone level, which is in Australia, we've had in the past 21 districts in our zone and in New Zealand, six districts, but that's now come down to about 24 club uh, districts in the zone. And then if you're luckier than that, you can get a role with Rotary International. And I've been lucky to have had roles at the club level, certainly, at a district level, at a zone level, and also to help out at a Rotary International level. And the most wonderful thing about Rotary is that, surprisingly enough, many people haven't heard of it, don't know what Rotary does. But in fact, the reason that I'm so excited to meet you and get to know you better is that Rotary is all about helping other people. It's all about getting personally involved in projects that make a difference. Could you tell us a little bit about Certainly. that? Look, um, when I was asked to join Rotary, I didn't know much about Rotary either. And um, I say to uh, my sponsor at that time still, I say, you harangued me into Rotary, but that's not the truth. The truth was I wanted to know a little bit more because it seemed like a great set of ideals to belong to this international club that had been around for nearly 100 years at that time. We have been around now 116 years and we've just celebrated our centenary this year in Australia and New Zealand. So when I was told about the ideals of service above self and, you know, putting back, I was at a stage in my life where the kids had grown up and I could put back. But I became a Rotarian three months after I joined Rotary at the Rotary Club of South Bank when I went to Hanover House in South Melbourne, which is a homeless shelter. And we were helping the Hanover team cook a barbecue for the homeless people that were staying there. And on the first occasion, there was a lady who was probably around 42. She had come from Germany with her husband and two boys about seven or eight years earlier. Um, he had passed away suddenly of a heart attack, had set up a manufacturing business, and through no fault of theirs, he found he, he was dead. So she lost the house, the business was too highly geared, and found herself in a homeless shelter with two boys. I think they were about 11 and 14. Um, and when I saw that, I thought that could have been my family. And uh, I was really, that day made me a Rotarian because if it can happen in South Melbourne or South Bank, it can happen anywhere. And it can happen to your friends 
and my friends, kids and families as well. And the next month when I went back to do the barbecue, there was a young indigenous lady there with five boys under the age of 14. And I'd taken some Nintendo product because I was working with Nintendo as a consultant at that time. And the expression on the faces of these kids with these toys that they hadn't had the opportunity to play with was spectacular. But even better was when they were having just a sausage in a piece of bread with some vegetables on it. It was just very, very special. So I think that may be a Rotarian, but what we get out of Rotary, and I'm surprised a lot more people don't know about it because so many of us make friends in Rotary like we have never before, and we learn and grow. We get to become public speakers, we get to do international projects, we get to turns to run the club as president or treasurer or secretary and do different things. So it's one of those situations where you didn't realise how much better it really was than what you thought when you initially thought you were going to put a bit of time into it. Yeah. So I want to share it with everyone and just make sure that people like you and me with the same values and integrity can get to experience Rotary because it's a good thing to actually look after your community and, and, and put back, but there are special privileges as well. Absolutely true. So you were saying that your uh, kids were grown and you had a bit more time, and so was that the impetus for becoming involved more in community and helping out, or were there other things going through your mind when you, when, when you were looking for something to do in this area? Well, not really. I had a good business going, still have, in Southbank. And I was called by one of the leaders in the district who became a district governor the year after we became a club. And she just invited a number of businessmen and women to the club for information evenings. And coincidentally, there were quite a few people that we that knew each other there. And so that just brought us closer together and uh, it became, you know, uh, something that we looked forward to and I still look forward to meeting my clan on a Tuesday night at 6 for 6.30, having our meeting and sorting out the world's problems. So you were in your 30s or 40s, we don't have to get spe more specific than that, but you'd had a fairly full life, which we'll talk about, and the concept of um, giving back to the community, other than, I'm sure, donations of money and thing over the years, that wasn't something that you were really uh, thinking about or that you thought would become such a large part of your life. Can you talk a little bit about, um, about that um, now that you know, from the perspective of hindsight, now that you know how much you get back personally? Um, because a lot of people don't. A lot of people go through life, they'll give a donation for whatever is the cause of the day, but um, they don't realise how much real enrichment of your own life you get. Look, there's um, a good adage that goes something like, uh, you get back what you put in, and um, I think I've been very lucky, I'm the eldest of seven children that arrived here from India in 1970 at the age of 14 and basically you know I went to work to help mum and dad uh, to cover the cost of the family living because we came out with nothing and um, I studied and I worked and um, my family were well looked after by a number of people in our local church, in the community. In fact, we've, um, I've just, mum and dad, uh, mum passed away a year ago, and I've just picked up her dining table that we were given by the Catholic immigration people. Wow. And it's an old, really old antique. It's not an antique, it's a, it's a dining table, but we had so much fun around it, and someone gave that to us. So I've taken it down to, uh, 
someone who's revarnished it for me and brought it up back to new, and it's now got pride of place in, in my place. And I reflect back on when we first got it and how lucky we were to have that dining table um, given to us. And I think being helped by so many people when we first got here, uh, given every opportunity we had, and all my siblings have done very, very well, and mum and dad did very well. Did you speak English well when you arrived? English is our mother tongue, so okay. we're Anglo-Indian, and in fact, we only spoke English at home. Uh, I still speak a little bit of Hindi and can read some Sanskrit, because when we were studying in India, we had to do our main subjects in English, because we went to a Catholic school, and we wanted to do that as a family, but we also had to pass the state language and the language of the country, which was always a difficulty. But coming here was the best thing that my parents could have done for us. It's a land, it still is a land of opportunity, uh, but in every land of opportunity there are people who slip off the margins through no fault of their own, and I think we should help them. Absolutely. So that's what all about. Absolutely. And so when you arrived here at age 14, you were no stranger to uh, strange lands. Uh, you had been to 27 schools up until that time? It was a strange experience coming here, and I'll come to that, but yes, in India my father was in the army, and the job he had as an army officer took him uh, in the engineers for three months to here and six months there. and So it was a great was lifestyle because I felt like Huckleberry Finn goes to India. Uh, you know, we lived in the Agra Fort overlooking the uh, Taj Mahal for about 18 months in Bombay Harbour, sailing. It was a crazy life, but coming to Australia was very So it was, special. all those schools were within India. You within travelled India. a lot within India, not overseas Never until overseas. Australia. You know, Lily, High on Life is really all about change your attitude, change your life. And I'm listening to you talking about how wonderful you thought it was changing schools so often, whereas the story I've heard from a lot of people who didn't change nearly as often was how terrible it was how awful it was you had to make new friends new and so their attitude was very different to yours Lily it's what you make of it isn't it um, I found it and I still find it easy to talk to people um, and I think that experience made it so for me and every new location brought new opportunities new friendships and uh, as a young boy growing up new um, experiences um, so yeah I think so was it was it the fact that you had six other family members that was sort of brought along to these new schools or were you just the kind of kid that um, was naturally happy wherever you were or what what do you remember about your personality and those early years that made you that adaptable? Uh, I think uh, my father was uh, the influence in bringing me up to be self-sufficient and my two sisters after me were the little sisters and then every year, every two years that mum and dad seemed to have another child so I saw them as really young babies that I had to look after kind of thing so there was the elder brother that I took, but also I had friends that I made in every location and they'd be international friends and local friends and I had I was very big on um, uh, writing letters to you know people overseas and exchanging letters and having pen pals. What kind of people? Uh, I had a great uh, long-term pen pal in uh, Netherlands and in Germany and in England and. Uh, Interestingly, they were all girls, but uh, <laughs> that was probably the age that I was. And um, I, my one regret is that I've let 
I've lost those connections over the last 40, 50 years now. So. Facebook, that's what it's for. It, you know, that's exactly <laughs> right. I should, I should look that up. Mm. Um, and so d changing schools that often was really for you, just the same as somebody going to the same school. You just adapted, did, did what you need. Was there much difference between the schools in India? Um, not really. Uh, we ended up, I ended up going to a lot of um, schools run by Christian Brothers or the priests, um, St. Don Bosco's, um, CDC. Um, and so their standards were always very high. And um, I just seemed to have a good balance of subjects that I did and sporting pursuits and then being able to sail or... And were you prepared for this trip to Australia as in did your parents tell you about it so you had time to think about it, look it up or anything or did you just arrive here and um, had no, to adapt? We, we all, um, well, my sisters and myself and mum and dad reviewed yearbooks from all of the Commonwealth countries because we knew that we wanted to leave India because we found that there was discrimination against us being the descendants of uh, the old British uh, Raj, if you like. And um, so we knew when I was seven that we were going to leave um, and we chose India. Sorry, we chose Australia. Um, but when I came here, I thought we had uh, kangaroos and trout and fish and Burke Street kind of thing. And my friends over here thought we had elephants and <laughs> tigers running around the streets of India. So it was a romantic notion of what we thought we'd see here. Uh, but I have no regrets in coming here. At all. So was it the expat community that took you in or the church or a combination of both? Or how, what do you remember from that time about integrating? Well, it was really funny. Dad went to work straight away. Um, I think he arrived here with $68 in his pocket with the seven kids. So, And interestingly, we actually stayed at Linden House, which isn't far away from here, from your studio uh, in Ackland Street. And the family who ran it knew that we were running out of money, so they kept us there for two or three weeks longer, whilst we found a house to rent in Canterbury Road, St Kilda. So a lot of people helped mum and dad to have that kind of support and success, which we're, I'm certainly very grateful for all these years later. Um, and what about your responsibilities as one of the older children and <laughs> in, in settling in yourself and helping your family settle in? I think... We knew we were migrants here and life would be different. In India we had servants and we had everything given to us, but here life was going to be different in terms of our careers and opportunities. So we, we knew the reward for settling here was going to be becoming good citizens of Australia, but contributing to our careers and, and making a, a difference. Um, but when we landed here, I've still got a photo of us landing in Darwin, and we were told by the Catholic immigration people to bring as many warm clothes as we could. So we had parkas and jumpers and pullovers on, and, and we arrived in Darwin at about quarter to midnight, and everyone's in their thongs and shorts and drinking beer. And, <laughs> In the pub there, there was a guy with a big carpet python around his neck. I've got that image just stuck in my mind forever. And I looked at Dad and said, who ever told you that this place was cold? <laughs> <laughs> but then the next day we travelled to Melbourne and we found out how cold things could be. So the discrimination must have been um, frightening for the future to leave that kind of comfortable life to come to Australia. Was it a fear of death or a fear? No, no not, not so much a fear of death, but... Um, for mum and dad, particularly for my father, he, he would have been fine 
he had a career path with uh, the armed forces and uh, he, he, he would have done very, very well. So I regret that he made this decision for us, but I'm glad he made it for us as well. Um, you know, discrimination is a funny thing. If you're different in Japan, you'll get discriminated against. If you're different here, you get discriminated against. So I tell the story of how in India I was a white blah, blah, blah. But I came to school here, and because we lived in Canterbury Road, I enrolled myself at a school down the road. And uh, a young um, Greek boy, who we became really good friends, but he called me a wog when we were in a little bit of a sorting out period when I joined the school. And when I found out what wog meant, I just cracked up laughing because that's just silly. <laughs> of course, but there was quite a bit of discrimination back then. back then in 1970. We also came as immigrants as mm. well. So everybody was um, making fun of everybody else. But I think it was different in Australia. Look, I think Australia is a great place. Our neighbours were fantastic. Uh, the next door neighbour was a great gentleman and he gave me a job in his milk bar. Uh, and then I got a job at the news agency, some Jewish, Jewish family owned in Fitzroy Street. And so look, let me just ask you, how would you describe yourself, like your personality and what kind of kid you were before you left India? As, as a child, I, I've got to tell you, I, I was very shy. I would find it hard to pick up the phone and I'd get into trouble with the old man for not answering the phone. But shy doesn't mean that you can't go out and be self-sufficient and I think I was always self-sufficient mm. because from a young age um, that's what I was encouraged to do. And then after about a year in Australia would you say your personality changed? Um, no, I, I think I was always going to be a business person, an entrepreneur uh, that's the way I think I'm wired. And the reason I ask you that is because you did share the story of when you started working um, with the newspapers, and I'd love you to share that with the audience. And is and whether your innovation, uh, where that came from inside you. So well, look, tell us the story first. This is this is not a story of Philip, uh, the the person now or in in business, but I think. I learned that if you were cheeky and asked for things, you got it. So uh, when I first started working at the St Kilda Railway Station selling papers, I put up a sign saying, no tips, no papers. And I got a lot of tips. <laughs> <laughs> so You must have been adorable as well. <laughs> uh, I, I think I was cheeky. Yeah. And uh, so people like that. And uh, I think, again... You know, the local people really um, did uh, inspire me and look after me as a child as well. And then you were working because you really had to. You had to help your parents and the family and everything. And that, but you were also studying at the same time, which is not that easy, especially in a new environment. Can you talk a little bit about those times? Studies were quite, um, quite enjoyable and uh, that first school I went to I only went there for about three months because I'd come home and uh, my father would say to me where's your homework and I'd go I haven't got any <laughs> and I'd get you know he's an ex-army officer so I'd get smacked and uh, so he said I don't like this so he asked me to go to CBC St Kilda which is in East St Kilda so I went there and I enrolled myself and I got a promotion and I loved CBC St Kilda and the teachers there the teachers were fantastic and um, uh, did you have a vision of what you wanted to do or where you wanted to go or you were studying to find out uh, my father wanted me to be an engineer because he was an engineer and I'm really not why that way I'm a people person. So I very quickly decided that what I wanted to do was marketing and I joined a company as a marketing cadet uh, and studied 
at Swinburne. Um, but I've, I like learning new things and I like exploring new opportunities and um, I just fall into things one door leads to another door and just that, that's just the way it's happened with me so I was lucky to get a job with after nine years with the first company to get a job with an international recruitment search company. Now you say you know doors opened and you were quite lucky and so in retrospect you do recognize that part of that was that you were open to those things happening or to whatever was going to happen so it's it happens all the time to everybody but not everybody is aware that they have options and choices and can go different directions. Well I think you're a migrant as well. Um, it's it is special to have experienced living in a different country and to come to Australia with so many opportunities. Uh, whilst at the news agency, just going back to that, I used to drop off the papers for a Caravella Hotel, Travel Lodge Hotel in Canterbury Road, which is across the way from our, our house. And uh, they shut the restaurant down. So I said to the management, I said, why are you doing that? And he said, it's not making us money. So I said, if I ran it, how much do I have to pay you? And basically they said, if you do the breakfast, we'll let you run the restaurant as well. So I, I, I just find one door opens another door. If you're so at doing the, the age right of... That was, you were 17 years old and, and you'd CBC. never run a restaurant before, no. but you just decided you could do it. Why? Because I could. How did you know? Uh, you've just got to have an imagination and I hired a chef. Uh, I could cook bacon and eggs and I could cook meals for my family. So, so you were cooking meals for the family and you figured a restaurant wasn't going to be that much different? No, we had a bit of fun with it and designed a logo called the Garlic Clove and um, had, a, had a ball with it. I was finishing my studies at uni and I had my new job so I couldn't do everything. Uh, and then uh, we had our first daughter so you know literally I find doors close when another one's about to open. In the school system here you had uh, I think a lot of relationships start up at the dancing classes. And it certainly uh, started for a number of my friends that way. So if you were a shy person, you know, this was a way to overcome that and start a relationship that was long lasting. And I've actually got a lot of friends from school, both girls and young fellows now who are old geezers like me. And we catch up a lot and have a lot of fun. But the one interesting thing is when we have those reunions, just to look at them and go, I can't believe you're looking that old. And then I've got to look at myself in the mirror and go, I'm looking that old too. <laughs> <laughs> that is strange, um, coming back and walking into a party yeah. and looking around at what everybody else looked like. Absolutely. Absolutely. And particularly after COVID, I, I think a lot of people will be catching up this weekend with each other. And they're all going to be saying, you've put on some COVID KGs, or you've grown some hair, <laughs> COVID hairstyles. So it'll be a lot of fun catching up with people. So, Philip, were there any challenges in taking over the restaurant? I don't just mean time-wise, but things that that you all of a sudden you thought, okay, now I've got to fix this. You know, that wasn't supposed to happen. Or were there surprises and things where you had to change direction? There were a lot of surprises because I hadn't reckoned on going to the markets at 4.30 in the morning. Um, but there was also a lot of fantastic surprises and friends that, you, that I made there when I was a little bit older. Um, and um, I think the experience taught me how to deal with people and get the best out of people. So. It wasn't a very big restaurant, but it was big enough to have a number of different cultures meet, particularly at a place called the Garlic Clove. Um, I 
nights of fabulous evenings there, just sitting down with the patrons and opening a bottle of wine and sharing it. It's all about it. relationships. It is. Relationships and how you develop those. So when you started working, was it in HR and when you'd was it what you thought it would be or did that also bring some surprises that you had to change direction in your thinking? I, my first job changed all the time on a regular basis. You got different opportunities and promotions and things like that. But going to this international human resource recruitment firm, uh, I hadn't thought about it. And I went into it a little bit um, blindsided, but I took to it immediately. I loved it. And I'm still doing that. What blindsided you? Um, I hadn't thought of a career in building teams or building people, people's careers or working at finding talent for companies at all. I didn't even think that there was such a thing. And so I actually love working in that space and uh, I love my rotary. So having my own business now for the last 30 something years, it's, it's a pleasure to be would it be, that balance. Would it be um, true to say that when you come across things that surprise you or stumbling blocks or it really is still a positive experience of, okay, what do I do with this now? And it's an opportunity to, um, to, to fix it and to go in another direction rather than throw up hands or rather than put you in a place of despondency? I rarely get despondent. I I like using problem solving skills and creativity to come up with a solution, particularly when it's a people issue. Uh, it's such an amazing resource to have when you have people working at their best and uh, you can see them feeling good as well. Uh, so. If they're feeling good, then the company's going to be good. And uh, so the better I, I you feel, the better you by, feel. I get motivated by making sure that I'm helping to build that sort of success. What surprised you most about people since you're working with that many? People never stop surprising me, uh, and that's why I've got a job. <laughs> because you, the biggest problems come from, from people getting together and not agreeing and then trying to sort it out is, is, is uh, what I do and what HR people do, what a lot of leaders do. And uh, so no, no surprises other than I'm glad that people are people. Do they change? I've been having this discussion with your friend Sylvie, <laughs> and uh, I don't think, you know, there's that saying, leopards don't change their spots. Um, you can, the environment can change you a little bit, so if you put someone from one environment into another, it does change you, but if you're very good at people management or you're a very good social integrator, you're always going to be that. And, on the reverse if you are not liked. So you've been putting people into companies for about 33 years or something you were saying um, and I'm assuming that some of those people from your early days are still around and you're still working with them. Well I've been doing this now for nearly 40 years next year and yes I have relationships that have been going a long time and in fact a lot of the members of the new Rotary Club that we've started as a satellite club of my original club, uh, the CEO Satellite Club, a number of those members are people that I've known for 20, 30, 40 years. And, uh, so like you've, and you've seen them go through many things. Uh, so I was also going to ask you, which I might ask you first, is um, how did your life change when you had kids? You've got three children who are fully grown now um, did, 
didn't <laughs> impact on me at all. Uh, I think I've been a good dad. I encourage the girls to grow up uh, as independent young people. Did it make you more aware of the world around you? Did it make you think more closely about topics you hadn't thought of before, like safety, like um, the world generally? Like, did it change any of your attitudes or you would, you'd looked after your brothers and sisters when you were young and so having your own kids was just a delightful extension of that? I think, again, very lucky to have grown up around St Kilda and seen a lot of real life and also growing up in India and some very big cities that, you know, the population of Australia would be the same for. Um, so I, I, when the kids came along, particularly when they were teenagers, the girls, I just said to them, look, if you want a glass of wine, you've got to be able to have it. And if you want to go after a relationship, go after it. You know, I don't want to mollycoddle you and tell you not to go and do that or not to travel. I've, in fact, gone the other way and encouraged them to travel. And all three kids have travelled extensively. And uh, the two girls have now been working once in London for the last seven years, and Catherine's been in New York for the last five years. And they thoroughly enjoy it, and I know they're safe. And they can go to Costa Rica or wherever, uh, dangerous places, some might say, but I know that they'd be safe. So. Mm. That innate sense of knowing. So just going back to the people you've worked with for that many years who have also gone through their own life experiences, have you seen changes in other people? Because that's often um, easier to see. I think... I was commenting on this the other day. I, I think uh, Australia has become more casual. Um, I remember jumping on planes and everyone had a suit on. Well, you don't see that now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that might be a good thing. Um, so we're more egalitarian, I think, and we're more accepting of diversity. Has this pandemic changed you in any way? Um, not really. I, I, I am worried about getting COVID, particularly in the next year or so. I've double X. I think that's sensible. Sorry for those listeners who don't want to be vaxxed. No, no, it's a polarizing issue and people feel passionately both ways. But look, I've had friends get it and pass away overseas and locally. Um, and so it does worry me that, you know, you could be healthy. So we've got to learn to live with it, but also be smart about it and be not overcautious, but uh, live your life and uh, just be, be, be weary about, uh, not weary to the point where you're not living your life, but just careful. Well, what it's done for me personally, because I realised there were so many things that I couldn't control. Not that I was a control freak, but, you know, I like to have options and, and ways to go if I don't like what's happening. I'm not deeply religious, but I have come to a greater belief in faith. God, whatever that means, not specific, even though I'm Jewish, it's not specific to the Jewish God. I believe all will be well. And just as there are people every day that die on the roads or of cancer or many other things. The flu. The flu. This is something that also will be part of what we need to deal with. But the experience of the pandemic, the experience of being in lockdown and the experience of being so restricted for so long, you obviously were still working and, and are still working, so that didn't change so much. But was there anything that came out of all the restrictions and that, that did concern you in some way? No, I just had to get very adept at using technology and, and uh, talking to people online on Zoom or Teams. Or and with your girls living overseas in other places, um, 
was their experience of COVID in the countries they were living, did that enter into cross discussions between all of you a lot? Was there anything that you learnt or it was just a matter of it is what it is? This is the interesting thing. They were more concerned about me in Australia where we hardly had any cases. And here's, um, you know, Catherine and Laura Jane, Catherine in New York, Laura Jane in London, worrying about me here and wanting me to get the jabs. Uh, and they're catching the subway. <laughs> was that because they were worried about you as their parents? Or true. was it because of the footage that was coming out of Australia about how draconian our our experiences were here. The footage coming out of New York and London scared the hell out of me for them. And I think they were scared at what they saw locally in New York and London, thinking if that happened to my parents, mm. then that would be a problem. But look, I know it's also brought a lot, a lot of opportunities to us, and I think uh, we're going to see a lot of uh, concern in small businesses that hasn't really um, come to the surface as yet, but I think around March next year we'll see a lot of people struggling and I think we just have to be nice to each other and you know, tip people who are working in those small businesses that are struggling, mm. they've got to pay the rent. Um, the restaurant owner's got to, you know, the hairdresser's got to pay the rent and survive. Yeah. And I have quite a long intro to Lily High on Life, both at the, the beginning and at the end. And I repeat it every show. It's exactly the same. And I'm constantly told, oh, it's so long. Do you have to have all of it? But the sentiments in it are really what's important. And the essence of that is smile more, be kind. And when you speak to people, come from love. David Mann, who uh, is in your industry at 3AW, yeah. he's a good friend, and he was saying he went to see his dad at a nursing home in Box Hill the other day. And when he came out of there, this couple, or this old lady and this man were arguing. And really, it was, wasn't a nice look. So he went up to the man and said, can I help you, sir? And he said, the bloody wife has got the shopping wrong again. <laughs> and she just looked at him and said, it's none of your business. It's my husband. He's just upset with me. Just leave us alone. And he looked at the man and the woman and said, look, I've just come from there. There are people who just died of COVID and one of my best friends in the Alfred Hospital on a ventilator. What you're talking about is small. So she looked at him and he looked at her and they said, he's right. Let's go home. <laughs> so we, we can, we choose our attitudes, don't we? Absolutely. And so I'm really pleased to hear that you have a mantra at the start and the finish of your show, which would be high on life. And and Live your keeping life. people because it's a choice and you can be high on life all the time because it is it's something that you don't you don't have to buy anything you don't have to spend money you don't have to take the time you just make that shift in your head and that's why it's so important having people like yourself who have had a series of experiences throughout their lives and it has kept them in a mindset that a lot of people don't have so just listening to what you've been so generous in sharing with us makes a big difference to people when they realize, oh, I can think like that or this is possible. And that's really what this show is all about and why I started it. So I thank you very much for participating, for being so generous in sharing your experiences with us. And um, I'm, I've already committed to uh, to coming into the new Rotary chapter. So the I look forward to New Rotary Club in Elston Week. And if any of your listeners are interested in joining the local clubs that exist here, we'd be very happy to see them. 
uh, it is a good space where they can come and meet uh, once a week or once a month. And it's an international club, so you can Google Rotary anywhere you are around the world. We have people download these podcasts in the strangest places, including India, including, um, I don't know what the weirdest place is, but there were cities and towns that I'd never heard of in Eastern Europe where somebody was listening and uh, and downloaded a podcast. So Rotary Club, wherever you are. Come and join us. It's a very safe place to meet people and have a conversation. And we need more conversations, particularly coming out of COVID. Definitely. Thank you so much and appreciate your time. Thanks so much.